You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today I have a really cool guest, Doug Savino on, which is fun because you won't see that issue uh, when I pre-edit this thing. Thank goodness. (laughs) I, as you guys know, covering, I cover Virginia, Maryland pretty extensively, and I was really trying to get more into Pennsylvania area. And luckily I was able to happen upon, uh, Doug who had a great day on a lake that I didn't even know existed until this happened. And so hopefully we can learn a little bit more about him and also like, does Pennsylvania actually have bass waters in it? Cause I thought it was just trout fishing pretty much in the Susquehanna river. <laughs> Doug, how are you doing tonight? Good. How are you? So yeah, like kind of tell the story, like how did you, how did you get into all this? Um, and I've been fishing since I was a little kid. I mean, my family used to take me to like local lakes and we'd go out on a, a canoe. Um, and then, uh, as I got older, like when I was 16, I got like a John boat and I started tournament fishing with my buddy, just fishing like local small lakes that had like nine, nine horsepower restrictions. And then uh, I kind of got away from it for a little while. I went to college and and, uh, started a family and then got back into it when I was like late 20s. Got like a bass boat and started fishing like local tournaments again and um, on the bigger lakes and stuff like that. Now, so have you always been just a a PA native? Yeah, I've always lived in um, central PA. Okay. What, when did you start fishing tournaments? I was 16. Oh, wow. What was it? Um, we just fished like local opens and stuff when I was 16. And then, uh, I think I was maybe 20, maybe it was like 26, 25, 26 when I joined a, a local bass club here in Tyrone. And then I started fishing like more like state events and stuff like that when I was maybe 30, 31, like, uh, BASS nation and FLW. For the local club up there, like what were your waters then? Were you guys traveling like to the upper Bay and the, the Potomac and the, like, what was your range for the clubs for the Tyrone club? They fish mostly, uh, like race town, um, Sayers Lake, which isn't real far, but it's smaller. Um, also an amazing fishery, by the way, Sayers Lake has some huge fish in it. Um, oh. yeah, my personal best came out of there. It was seven pound, 11 ounce largey. There's some giants in there. <laughs> Holy moly. Yeah. Um, they fish the Clarion River. Uh, um, sometimes they'll travel to New York, like Lake Chautauqua, the Finger Lakes. And then Bass Nation, they normally fish like the Potomac, Chesapeake, Erie, um, Racetown. That's, you know, usually like the lakes they would fish. So going from a local club mm-hmm. to like the Bass Nation is a little bit of a jump. Like what? Was it just one day you just, you started to win every tournament in your local club and you're like, this is easy. Now I need to go to the next step. Like what, what made you want to take that jump? Um, yeah, it was kind of, it was more like money. Like, um, so like when you win like a local, like our local club, like you wouldn't make much money. And it was like, even if I got first place, I was still losing money on the gas and all that. So then I, <laughs> yep. So I, I started, uh, yeah. So then I was like, well, I kind of want to fish and, it, and it's not that I'm fishing things that are giant or anything like that, but the Bass Nation events were a little more money to get into and, and you would win in the thousands, you know, when you win. So then it made it worth winning, it, you know, when you, you'd pay for your gas and your hotel and everything where you weren't always losing money, even if you won. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's the biggest problem right now with just the whole industry as a whole. The guy- <clears throat> Spoilers, guys, just for you guys who didn't know this, I actually just came off of a three hour interview uh, when we were pre-recording this one. And that was a big uh, topic that we were talking about was just how blindingly expensive it is to travel and to tour, especially if you're trying to do it, like make it like the amount of money you need or time away from your family. It's just absurd. Yeah. yeah hotels, gas, definitely. Those are, the, those are the people that are making out on on fishing, not not the anglers. <laughs> So for your, how did the, how did, how did you enjoy the Bass Nation? Cause like for me, I'm, maybe I'm a little bit younger, but I, I never really got into the Bass Nation side of things. It was really more of high school than I fished in college and then made the transition to some BFLs. Yeah. So, uh, they didn't have high school and they didn't have college. I graduated high school in 2000, college in 2007. And they kind of, the college series, like they started right after I finished college, which I would have loved to have been in. Um, I went to Penn state and they have a pretty decent team. So that would have been awesome to be on in college, but they didn't have it when I graduated. Um, 
what was your question again? Um, just about the Bass Nation in general. Like, what were your thoughts about it? Like, how did it go? Did you enjoy them? Or? Oh, yeah, it's a great group of guys. And I enjoyed the local stuff, too. Another, like, it's a good group of guys, but it was more, like, geared and centered around, like, having fun and, and learn, you know, I mean, like, hanging out with your buddies. And, and, and Bass Nation is like that, too, but you can win more money. So it makes it a, little, much, a little more worthwhile. How much were you? How much were the entry fees back then for the Bass Nation? Uh, I think they were like eighty or a hundred bucks. Dude, I would kill for entry fees like that for BFLs nowadays. <laughs> yeah, right. I know it's it, it's expensive. Yeah, BFLs. I mean, and I I kind of like pester my wife a little bit about taking a crack at the opens, but it's like so expensive. We we couldn't afford. We're both teachers, so like, and I wouldn't have the time off to do it. But maybe someday. <sighs> But why would you want to fish the opens? Like, what? Well, like, I don't know. Like, I ask people this question all the time they come on the show. It's like, if you wanted just to make money back, it's like the Toyota series is probably the better option with the paybacks. So, would you? Are you? Would you want to just try to go pro and go to like the elites? Would that it be might, the thought? I, I mean, when I was younger, I always had that dream. But like, I've come to the realization that like, I mean, I'm 41. I have I have a family. I have two young kids. Like, I mean, it would be really really hard you can't just leave your job and, and try to do that at 41 with two kids you know what i mean like yeah so i try to it, my 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 shot at making it big is really through the bass nation like trying to work my way through all the all this all the hoops going through the you know the regional the national championship and then if you can make, get from there to the classic then yeah that's your shot how does that how does that work with the nations like how does that whole structure do you, do you, um, is it one event you have to fish or is it, is it like local regional state or local state regional it's so pennsylvania set up it used to be set up where it was districts and then states but now they kind of just got rid of the districts and they just have state events um and they just restructured again this year the whole country restructured the whole nation you know a bass master nation all restructured it but the way it's set up is i think this year it's four tournaments and they'll take like the top 10 i believe and uh like the top 10 in points at the end of the season. And those 10 will go fish like the regional, but there's like other stipulations, like start it's starting next year. There's other ways to make the regional as well. And I don't really love the way it's going, but like in years past, it used to be the top seven in the state. And then they'd have a last chance tournament where they'd take three more. So it was the top 10 would go to the regional. And then the top person in the state would go to the national championship. Mm, okay but they've restructured it for this year and it's really complicated and it kind of it's kind of like if you are willing to uh, get into more they have like these um i think they're called like opens or something like that where you can you can get into them and, and you can basically an extra chance to make the regional if you or if you're willing to pay the money and travel yeah i mean that frustrates me with the day with the bfls where it's like with yeah. the regional you can just buy into it it's yeah. like in baseball you can't be like guys we we didn't make the states but don't worry we just found enough money so we just bought our way in so you know it's yeah. great it's like it's not really a true right it's not it's kind of turning into the more money you have the more chances you have yeah and it just it takes away for the people the people that say like it's not a sport you're just giving them ammo when, when you start doing it like this right and one of the things i wish they would have done so the national championship used to be about 60 guys there'd be You'd have like your 50 from the States, one from each state, and then a couple guys from overseas. Like, uh, I think there, were, there was a guy from Italy, a guy from Spain, like there's diff different countries oh, sent wow. a guy. But then three guys go to the classic, so the top three. So they had three spots for the classic in the out of 60, right? Well, now you're going to have, oh, I think it's somewhere around 200, 250 boats in the national championship and still only three spots going to the classic. So, like, I really don't like that. Like, I think they should have increased the number of spots going to the Classic. If you're going to increase the the field to 250, you need to increase the Classic spots. Say, there's, you know, 10, 15 guys make it to the Classic now. That's so dumb. Like, yeah. why would you do that? Uh, more money in their pocket. So, like, they're, you know, yeah. with, with 250 guys going, now they're getting more entry fees. And, yeah. That's that's absolutely brutal. But you also mentioned off air that, you know, you've, you've made a heck of a run at it with the Bass, Na Bass Nation. Uh, yeah, 2019, I made it to the national championship. But I mean, I didn't come anywhere close to finishing the top three. It was at Lake Hartwell. And uh, I finished like 30 something. Not very good. <laughs> but you made the national championship. Like, I mean, like. Right. Yep. My buddy actually just made the classic. Um, he, he did the same thing as me, went to the national championship, but he finished third 
They made it to oh, the wow. Classic this year. Yep. So he fished that's, the Classic just a couple of days ago. That's freaking awesome. Yeah, yeah. it's so, really awesome. We we're all rooting for him. So, he like, did. what lakes were were you fishing locally to do that? Like, how is that structured where you are? Um, so the Bass Nation, I think. You like I said, normally they're going to fish like Race Town's usually a staple. That's usually on the list. And then it's usually the Potomac or the Chesapeake, and then usually Erie. Sometimes they've thrown Conneaut Lake, which is a real little lake, but um, has some pretty nice fish in it. Um, Conneaut Lake. I yeah, it's, <laughs> it's tiny, actually. You think race down small. Conneaut's like, you could almost spit across it. I have fished from Okeechobee to the St. Lawrence, and I have not heard of any of these lakes that you've been talking well, about. Well, I'm sure you've heard of the Potomac and the Chesapeake and Erie. But, well, yeah, those. Yeah, but yeah, Racetown's a big lake. I mean, it's 26 miles long. Um, see it's just fish. thin. It's like, it's almost like it's not very wide. It's got a lot of coves and inlets and things like that, but. That's just because, yeah, because like I've been looking at this, guys, and I'm sorry about this, just for the people that are, if you're a, a iHeart listener or a Spotify listener, you can switch over to YouTube, you can see, so like this is Raystown Lake, which looking at this, it literally just looks like a river that was right. named up. It there does. is not a lot of coves at all in this sucker. No, it's very, it's very much like a river. Like, so, I mean, just, just for, to kind of like, just again, never to give up any juice, but since it seems like Raystown is like one of the biggest lakes in, in PA, like, yeah. what is this like? Is it, is it just, is it flat and shallow? Is it no, just super deep, uh, very deep, very clear, clear, deep, um, gets like 250 feet deep. Um, good God. Yeah. The average depth wow. is, is pretty deep. Like it's, it drops quick off the bank. Uh, very clear water, um, gets pressured a lot, a lot of, a lot of pleasure boaters, a lot of fishermen. I mean, as you can imagine, like you said, you there's not many lakes in PA, so like people travel to Race Town from pretty far away just to go hang out and have fun or fish. There's not a lot of different lakes to fish. So this sounds a lot like Deep Creek Lake, where you have like you have the the summer boat traffic issue, and then yep. it's yeah, not been as to, bad. We we we've gone to Deep Creek a few times in tournaments. It's a lot like Deep Creek, only deep, really? yeah, the water's deeper and clearer, but yeah, very very a lot of traffic. And then this is where, and guys, you didn't know, I'll try to see if I can find a photo of it. Like you, you cracked an insane amount of, of weight for, for, um, oops, just lost my image for, for three. That was insane. That looked like something you see at a great lake. It was like, really, is, uh, yeah, it was a good day. Um, I, I fish all winter. Like a lot of times race town won't freeze up and you can go out. And actually my favorite time to go is January, February the lakes that you pretty much have it to yourself and there's some big ones up shallow. Um, it's, uh, it, you know, you, you think that's a big bag and it is a good bag, but like it puts out some pretty nice bags. It's got some big small mouth and large mouth in it. I mean, is Raystown your home water? Yeah. I mean, I lived, I lived probably 30 minutes from it. Actually for a while, I lived about 15 minutes from it. I lived in Huntington, which is right next to it for about eight years. My wife taught there. So we lived oh, wow. down there. Yeah. We, we lived next to the lake for about eight years. It was awesome. We used to come home from work and just go fishing. But now, now it's about thirty minutes away. That's wow. Okay, like I didn't even know like there were smallmouth in this place. But that's absolutely insane. So it's probably is what's probably helped you when you go up north. Then too is having a place like this that can teach you how to fish for them. Yeah, it's a good lake for cutting your teeth on because I mean it's and now it doesn't have like a ton of grass in it. They they kill off the grass every year, which stinks. But. uh I shouldn't say every year, but they've been killing it off lately. Um, but there's a lot of large mouth, a lot of small mouth. There's deep water. You can fish shallow. Like you can do a lot of different things that, that prepare you for other lakes. It's yeah. It's helped me with the Erie. It's very similar to fishing Erie. They, they actually poison the grass in that place. Yeah. They worry about it like, because the pleasure boaters are their main source of income. People coming into town, spending money. And so they try to make it enjoyable for them. Like they don't, they don't like the grass. It, it is frustrating because you see that down here at Lake Anna, and I know they've been talking about it on Deep Creek, but it's like the balance that, you know, the, the aquatic vegetation, we've had Odin Kirk on and some other DWR people, especially from Maryland, like sub aquatic vegetation is so important for healthy oh. fishery. And, you know, you get these people that just are there for one weekend and they're like, ew, you know, get rid of the grass. Like, <laughs> yep. But you don't understand the damage that it actually does to a fishery when you, when you kill it all. Yeah, I'm worried. I mean, we all worry about it. Like me and my friends, we all worry about what it might do in a couple, you know, like 10 years down the road. Like what's that going to do our, to our fishing? Because there's not a lot of coves, it looks like. So there's not a lot of spawning flats for these things. So like getting rid of the grass is probably not the best move by the state. No, I would not. I would not think. 
So what other fisheries are there in, in Pennsylvania that you think people should actually know about? I mean, the Susquehanna River obviously is really big, but that's kind of a place where you would want to have like uh, a jet motor and things like that. So I don't go there often, but um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a great place to go. Um, like I said, um, Lake Wallenpawpack up in uh, be north, northeast PA is pretty decent lake. It's pretty decent size. People like Pima tuning. Obviously, Lake Erie is really, really good. Um, Kenzu. Kenzu is not a great lake to go fish, but it has a, like you can go up there and catch a lot of fish. Just nothing very big. A lot of small, small mouth, like 15 inches might be a pretty decent fish for up there. That's the Allegheny Reservoir. Kenzu. Okay. I actually found that one. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, it's pretty big. Um, you have to have a New York license if you want to go over there, though, across the state state line so yeah it seems like these are a lot of highland reservoirs than in pennsylvania if you're going to be fishing them it seems like deep small mouth kind of yeah. things now sayers which i mentioned earlier which isn't far from me like it's kind of that and race town are within an hour of each other sayers is is more it might be called like there's there's like three different names for it some people call it sayers some people call it um howard i'm not sure what it's listed on your map there it's near uh, state college, I guess you could say it's closer to state oh, college. PA. Well, yeah, it's like central. Oh, yeah, but it's uh, it's low. It, it's pretty shallow. It, you catch a lot of largies there. Some some giants. I know a couple guys that go. You know, they travel two and a half, three hours just to come fish there. So it's pretty decent. Like, yeah, that's it there. It's the, and that's the other thing about Pennsylvania. Like, there's some pretty nice lakes that are uh, restricted horsepower. So like, um. You know, I might not even be able to take my boat out on it. Like I, I'd have to use my trolling motor. A lot of the, a lot of the smaller lakes. I mean, these are like, yeah. I mean, this is, and this is one issue that you see in places where they don't have a lot of lakes. Is the lakes that you do guys have, they get absolutely pressured. Oh yeah, like those insane amount. Like, yeah, race town and Sarah's like, it. They definitely get a lot of pressure. You have to, uh, you have to finesse the fish for sure. That's act, but that that also serves you if if you're trying to make a run at it though to learn how to fish high pressured waters like that. Like that's the one thing about the Potomac River, you learn how to fish in a crowd, and mm -hmm. so it does have its benefits. Cutting your teeth on places like this, um, especially if you can learn how to like fish deep, deep smallmouth, because it's it's not a lot of places you can do that, and that's a great tool to have in your toolbox. Yeah, well, yeah, it would, yeah, benefits you to know how to do that in a lot of different places around the country for sure. Yeah, this place is this we place we is fish really a lot cool. of the finger lakes too like what like um like a lot of the tournaments like like our state championship actually was a lot of times up in cayuga and F for flw it would be like out of the state they would have their state championship in new york kind of kind of frustrating sometimes yeah yeah like hey how about a pennsylvania state championship in a pennsylvania lake but they would they would like new york lakes usually we would go to huca or cayuga chautauqua Chautauqua was fun. I remember going there for the, for the college FLW. That's a fun lake, and that really did teach me a lot about fishing lake grass. And dogs, um, yeah, back, and yeah, dog, and dog dogs. Fishing. Like, what what would you consider your strengths as an angler? Um, probably, yeah, finesse, definitely finesse, like spinning rods, um, drop shots. Um, pretty, I'm pretty good with a jerk bait, jigs. Smallmouth, yeah. smallmouth lures. I was, I was gonna, I was gonna say it's like so basically smallmouth then. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean oh, for man. the Potomac, like I mean, I'll, when I go to the Potomac, I'll flip and 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 like throw around Texas rig and stuff like that. But most of our lakes, you are fishing deeper, clearer water. Why is that such a a frustrating thing for people? Because it, it's so funny. Like growing up on the tidal Potomac, like I did. I don't think the title is weird at all. I just, because I, I always did it. But then if I go to, I, let's say, super like a Okeechobee thing or blueback herring in the Carolinas would be a better example. That's weird to me. What is it when people come up to, to your neck of the woods for the smallmouth deep clear? What what bothers people? Because look at Gussie, what he did. Like a smallmouth guy, he just absolutely dominated everybody else with yeah. that skill set up north. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I think people probably get a little intimidated by fishing deep, you know what I mean? Like the, in the clear water. I, I mean, I guess if you're familiar with, you know, pitching a lure that's, you know, 20 feet away from you, then, you know, when you're making longer casts and having to fish 20, 20, 20 feet plus, then it's probably a little bit intimidating. They're out of their comfort zone. 
do you think that's what it is? I, I think, and I think you can, I mean, people adapt to it. Like, I mean, I think I could adapt to fishing down South if I had to, if I was there long enough, it's just, you need time on the water and practice. Well, st- statistically it's, it's a lot, you have a better chance of being a pro being a Northern angler going South than it is being a Southern angler going North. Like you yeah. can just look at all the big names. Yeah. And, yeah. and so there's something about, I think it is small mouth specifically that like, what is it about them that just drives people insane? That is it just something that's second nature to you? You can just like read their minds or what is it that you guys understand about them that no one else does? I mean, big picture, not like getting into the juice or anything, but like, it, cause they are way more nomadic th- than largies are. Right. Yeah. I mean, they, I, I mean, I've kind of been forced to fish for them too. Like, I mean, you can win with race town with largies at race town and I, and, and, and it happens, but it's just not as consistent as smallmouth are. I feel like the average smallmouth are bigger than the average largemouth in that lake. Some lakes aren't though, like Sayers, like Sayers that that would definitely be a largemouth lake. Like you're not gonna. There's some big smallies in there, but you'd be better off facing, you know, ch- uh, chasing after the largies. I think you have to look at each lake individually and, and decide which one's going to make sense to go after. But um, I personally like that catching smallmouth. It it fits my skill set better. Um, I, I like fishing you know, longer casts. I don't know. I just feel more comfortable doing, I guess, cause I grew up doing it. Mm, okay. Are you using like forward facing sonar too, or are you just using 2d? No, I have it. I do have forward facing sonar, but I'll be honest with you. Um, sometimes it frustrates me a lot and I don't even use it. Like, really? um, I might like scan an area real fast, but I don't sit there and stare at it. Like Gussie did. <laughs> Um, I'll just fish. Like I, I just find myself spending too much time trying to find my lure and make sure, you know, and then, I, and then if I see a fish, like, uh, like follow it, I get frustrated. So I, I honestly, sometimes I don't even look at it. That's fascinating. Cause like most <laughs> people that have it swear by it, and especially people from up North. That, I that think there are times it. where it, it's definitely <laughs> like, you need to be looking at it. Like, um, but then I think sometimes, honestly, like I, on these high pressured lakes, I wonder if you get if you're close enough to be seen on the forward facing sonar, I don't know. I don't know if it doesn't make them skitter, skittish before, you know what I mean? Before you even cast them. I'm, I'm making yeah. pretty long casts. Like when I, when I fish, I make pretty long casts. Why? Um, I, cause I feel like the fish that I, that I'm fishing are pretty pressured. Mm. We hear about that a lot down here when it comes to like Smith mountain Lake. I have a guy, I have <clears throat> Billy Coles who comes on, who's a guy down there at Smith. And he talks about like when the tournament season really ramps up, he, he can feel with his four facing center that the fish start to shy away a lot, a lot farther away from the boat than they normally do. Yeah. And that is interesting with technology now that everybody has it now that hummingbird and Garland right. and Lawrence all have it. It's just besides giving the fish cancer, probably. Well, <laughs> the, and I, the, think the, they, I think they, I mean, you can, I'm sure they can hear the pings and clicks of it. So like sometimes oh, I'll, yeah. I'll even shut off my, electronics sometimes if i if i'm fishing a spot i know really well i won't even use it like i'll just shut stuff off and just go fishing well how do you deal with fishing a pressured lake like that mentally like like like, the example is like like in the tournament that that you did well in i mean i'm assuming you're not just the only person in an area so is, is it something mentally that you struggle with when you have a lot of people around you do you try to fish part of the crowd or you try to get away from them I definitely try to get away from people. Um, I don't know. And I also try to throw different stuff than other people do just to you know, give the fish a different look. Cause I feel like they do see a million, um, you know, a million like jigs and a million. Yeah. So I try to throw something a little different. Hmm. Yeah. Cause like, to me, it's like, it's, it's really understanding when to, when do you stay and when to go. Um, and, and then like when just to gut it out in a spot. I mean, if you look at some of these Japanese studs that you see on the tour right now, like, and again, like it's because their home country's got one lake in it, but you know, they brave a lot of these places, these quote unquote community holes and just deal with the pressure. And they somehow always grease it out where I feel like it's an American mindset where it's like, well, I have a two fifty. clearly I must run 200 miles to get away from everybody. Yeah. And it, it's just a fascinating dynamic. But then you also throw in like the kayak guys and the kayak guys are like, well, I can't go anywhere. So like right. where I put in, like I must learn how to milk this spot. Mm-hmm. but it's, it's fascinating when it comes to a strategy. And I think there's places where you do have to fish in a crowd. Like, I mean, if I went to the Potomac, I mean, you're going to yeah. look for the grass and everybody like, where's the grass? It's where 50 boats are sitting. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, I mean, I don't know it well enough to, 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 to find my own, 
like secret spot at the Potomac. So like, I'm going to fish the grass that everybody else is fishing. If I go to the Potomac. Um, and that's, I mean, if it's your home, lake, you, you probably have a little bit, you have more spots to run to. And the home, like advantage, that's a whole other thing. Cause it's like mentally, how do you deal with not fishing history? Like that to me is the hardest thing for some of these guys that just always cash checks on, on these local bodies of water. Like, how you can fish clean in the present and not just revert back to your history. And that's yeah. just so freaking hard. Especially smallmouth, like you were saying, they are nomadic. Like they to find them one like where I caught those this week, I I mean I'll go check it out. Then I have some tournaments coming up this weekend. I'll check it out there, but that doesn't mean that they're gonna be there and I gotta be smart enough to leave if they're not there after, you know, an hour of not catching anything. I can't spend all day there. So are, are there gobies in there that they're they're hunting or is it or is it like blueback owl, or owl wives or they're probably, owl wives or like they're probably the biggest food source in that like and there is a ton of bait in that lake gotcha are they competing with other things like striper or something like that yeah they stock stripers in there um lake trout um trying to think lake that, trout, damn yeah, yeah yeah well it's deep yeah there's a lot of lake trout fishermen stripers um, those are probably, and then bass, people fish for catfish, channel cats and stuff like that. But I would say stripers and lake trout are probably the most popular species and then probably bass. Mm, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't think I could do that where it's just that, that nomadic. Cause it really does sound like a Lake Murray or Lake Hartwell where it is just a run and gun type of thing. <clears throat> now, um, you know, moving off of Raystown, like are there any lakes that have like a lot of dock stuff so you can work on your dock game that are local? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Uh, so Sayers doesn't have any docks and Racetown doesn't have any docks. And, um, Oh my God. Yeah. So for so me to no fish docks, I mean, should talk, like I would have to travel two and a half hours probably to find a lake that had, unless I Holy wanted to. Crap. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, that's crazy. Not, yeah. Conneaut has docks, but it's, I mean, if you're going to Conneaut, it's only another 45 minutes to go north to go to Erie. So I'm, I don't go to Conneaut unless I'm fishing our tournament, but it has docks and it's fun. It's a lot like Chautauqua, a lot, you know, with the docks and you can catch pretty decent large mouth there. And, but no, nothing locally really. You can fish docks and I like fishing docks. So it kind of sucks, but. Yeah, it, it's because I complain like always having to commute to like, with, with like the Shenandoah division, the BFL is where you have to go. But for you, oh my God. I mean, like you have a hike from most places you want to go besides um, like Raystown, you were saying. Like that's insane right. where they yeah. take you. Yeah, it takes, if I'm going anywhere other than Raystown or Sayers, and it, it's going to take a couple hours to get there. It, yeah. And the other thing about it is, is those places are going to be getting hammered because there's nowhere else for anybody to go. Mm. So... That's just so, I'm just fascinated by this, like as, as, as an angler, cause I don't hear a, lo a lot about PA bass anglers, especially the bass nation and how that kind of like, when you go up through that in these small places, these highly pressured areas, it almost sounds like kind of like an Ohio deal where the guys that come out of Ohio on the big tour, damn, they can catch one bass in a bathtub. They're just so good at being able to catch what's there. Yeah. Yeah, we we actually go to Mosquito Lake in Ohio a good bit too. Like that's another lake I fished a lot. Really? Well, yeah. I mean, it's a good lake to go to, and um, I mean, you catch a ton of fish there, so it's fun. A lot of like clubs like to go there because you can go get a limit, an easy limit. People have fun going there. So, hmm. Well, that's crazy. So then, what do you have coming up on your schedule? Well, uh, there's some local ones here at Racetown um, the next couple weeks, and then. Um, the first BASS, the first BA Bass Nation tournament is on the Potomac in May. And then the Northeast Regional is again on the Potomac in June. And then... Um, Potomac a third time. <laughs> no, that's it. For that, that's it. Um, and then uh, Racetown again for the PA Bass Nation. And um, where's their last tournament? I'm trying to think. They oh, they fished three rivers like um, uh, Harmersville Launch. Uh, near Pittsburgh, that's that's really tough fishing. Why are they doing that to you? Good uh, God, that's all we have. Uh, what is that like? It <laughs> took three pounds to win the classic there with Kevin uh, Van Dam and Aaron Martins. Uh, yeah, that's it? right. Actually, uh, I think it was 2019. I got second there at the at the three at the uh, three rivers at a bass. Because you caught one. <laughs> five pounds. I had five pounds. I had five. Oh fish, my God, he's killing fish. it. <laughs> I had five. I had a limit. I had a limit. Five fish for five pounds. And that was second. That was second place. Um, okay, you got to talk about that. Like, how did that? 
that's how do you practice for something where if you catch one you feel pretty cool uh like there are better fish on that on uh, you know to, to go there people fish the mon mon river which i guess has some bigger um smallies in it but um i don't know it well enough to run it so like i i went up the allegheny and caught some smaller ones and that was actually good enough for second because it was a tough day on the mon i think no normally but it's not like much better i think normally like 10 pounds is a pretty good bag there um <sighs> So, so then what? So how, how did you practice for that event? I, I just went out and, and uh, I tried the Allegheny River and I didn't go to the Ohio at all. I went the Mon River a little bit. It was so chocolate. It was like muddy that week. So I didn't really fish much in it. I just spent most of my time up the Allegheny. Did, did you know that you actually had it? when you caught th those five? Like it's, when, no, when I, thought, that low, I didn't think like... it was a good finish. I, I no, I didn't um no idea that it was going to be any good i didn't think it was going to get a check or anything like that like, i don't know, like th those grinders man i don't know my, <laughs> there's so a like, lot of like, yeah there's a lot of grinding i feel like in ta um i mean race town is actually a really decent lake like it it's these spring tournaments if if uh you know a five fish tournament like a five fish limit last year we me and my buddy won the um it was like a local race town buddy tournament and it, I think we had 21, almost 22 pounds. And, and that, that's not a guaranteed win. Cause there's some really good sticks on that lake. Like a lot of really? guys, not, oh my, yes. Yeah. So there's some, yeah, there's some locals there that are really good every week, every, like they, they're going to come in with a good bag and it's, it has some big fish in it. I, I, that's so crazy. Cause like, again, I mean, this might be the, I, I'd never even heard of this place. How big is it? Is it 26, comparable? 26 miles long. 26 miles long. Okay. But like you said, mostly it looks like a river. Like it's not very wide. Yeah. So it really does condense down the people. Okay. So it probably does fish small comparatively to other places. Yeah, it does. Like you're usually within a hundred yards of somebody. Maybe like, well, maybe not that close. Maybe within 200 yards of somebody. So if you take Raystown out of it though, I mean, you're talking about low weight tournaments. Like, you know, for, for people that don't fish, you know, Lake Gunnersville, let's say like, how, what is your mindset when you go into grinding events? Is, is it a little different than when you go to like race town where you feel like, Oh, I'm going to catch fish that are like uh, good enough to take a picture with. Well, like, I feel like the grinder events, like I actually do better at because uh, I don't know, like I, I know other people are struggling and I'm not going to give up. You know what I mean? Like I'm not going to put, I'm not going to put my rod down. Like other people might eat a snack or something. I, I just keep fishing hard. Um, mm. I'll tell you what, like you, you were saying a grinder Sayers actually puts out some huge bags as well. Like, like I think last spring they caught it. There was a nine pound large you caught there. Like it, it really, might, yeah. So you might see a double digit large mouth come out of Sayers soon. Wow. Yep. Yep. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Sayers versus Sayers. That was the one you looked up earlier. Like the smaller. Okay, that one right there. Okay, gotcha. Huh. So then, like, like continue with what you're saying about like your, your mindset. I mean, if it's a tough tournament, like I, I just I know everybody. No, because like I think a lot of people, um, they understand how to deal with success, but they don't know how to deal w with with failure and w with difficult times. And I know, <clears throat> you know, we talked a little bit beforehand about like you know you you coach sports and, and the idea of like I think the mindset and your approach when you get into this stuff is so important. It's not just about knowing like the secret spots, but also knowing how to deal with adversity and how you approach things like this. And I feel like. A lot of people know how to approach a slugging match. You go to the Potomac, you know what to expect. You go to Smith Mountain Lake, some of these, the, the Chickahominy River, you know what to expect. But when you get into tournaments, and these are usually the regional tournaments, guys, is like when you go to like Kerr in October and it's, and it's terrible, you know, how do you approach that? Not just with your tackle, but your mindset that you're not going to get a lot of bites and you have to grind to it. And that's hard for people that aren't used to doing that on, on fisheries. Did I lose you? No, I can hear you. You asked me how I deal with that? Cool. What, how, how do you approach it with your gear, with your tackle? Um, like, ex like that, that three rivers turn to me is fascinating. Cause like I would have lost my mind. There was no way I would have done well with that. It's just, well, and it kind of suits my style of fishing though. Like I, I finesse fish a lot. So, um, when it's tough, finesse fishing usually prevails, you know what I mean? So it's not, when I, when I go to a tournament and it gets tough, I'm not I actually maybe make me feel a little bit more. Uh, confident you know what i mean like because i feel like other people might be struggling more than i am what what is finesse because this is a relative thing so you know in florida finesse fishing might be like i'm going to use under 30 pound test like what is finesse fishing for you 
Um, six pound tests, seven pound tests, drop shots. Oh God, that's uh, like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fun. Um, you know, uh, I don't love a Ned rig, but I mean, I've thrown it before. It's not my favorite. You don't thing like do. a Ned rig? Really? I don't, well, I just feel like it usually catches smaller fish, but I know you can get bigger fish on it. Eerie, like up at Erie, I'll throw it and I can catch four or five pounders, but, uh, yeah, a lot of lakes and Ned rigs probably not going to get you giants, but it's going to get you a quick limit. Yeah, as I say, like that, that here on, on the upper Potomac and the Shenandoah river, man, that, that, that's a staple for smallmouth. Oh yeah. Is you, yeah. Yeah. Do you do a lot of river fishing? Just like the Susquehanna, just like wading creeks or anything like that? No, I don't. I've always kind of bass fished. Like even when I was younger, I, I just, I mean, like you said, there's a lot of rivers, a lot of trout fishing in PA, but I've always just gravitated towards bass fishing. Who got you into it then? I don't know. Like I said, I went with my, my parents growing up. Like uh, they would take me out on a canoe and we'd fish like the smaller lakes, like Black Machan and Canoe Creek. Like these yeah. are real, really small lakes that are like electric only. Um, and I just really like, I had a pond near my house. I used to go out and fish every day. Like, um, just, I, don't, I think I kind of got myself into it. My brother got me into it more when I, he, he got a boat when I was about 12 and we used to go fishing on his bass boat. That would get you hooked. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. First, first time on a bass boat. So yeah, I mean, I think my family, but I, I also just always had a love of it myself. So do you remember your first bass? No, I would have been, no, probably caught it one of my parents when I was really young. I can remember some of the bigger ones I caught down at the pond near my house when I was younger though. Like, really? Yeah. I can remember like the first one, it was probably over five. Like I ran up to the house asking my mom to bring down a camera and take a picture of it. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Like, I mean, it, it, you know, I, I like to ask guests that cause it, it's so interesting, like who actually gets us hooked on this and you know, me growing up, you know, right outside of DC becoming hooked on fishing that's not normal and it was actually like i just i was in the right place at the right time and then i had a mentor you know somebody that actually got me into it and and then for you to be in trout country and, yeah because that's what really pa is famous for it's like that is also fascinating like then how do you get into this bass world in a place that probably is not what i would consider like the mecca for like bass heads and that's right. fascinating that's yeah fascinating. it's fascinating yeah, you just kind of deal. You kind of deal with you know, what with, with the pressure that that the lakes have on them, and and learn how to fish with it. Now, what do you think you would like to? Is it docks that you think would be the biggest thing that you would want to try to strengthen in your game, or is there parts of it that you would like to strengthen? What what, what would they be? Um, I don't get to use a crankbait a whole lot. Um, really? You can use it at Sayers, like because it's shallow enough. To throw, you could throw it at Racetown if you went, um, you know, up at the top, like the up towards the river end of the lake. It's shallower at that at that end of the lake, but it'd be pretty tough to throw it. Like Racetown drops off really fast. Like if you're ten feet off the shore, you're probably sitting in thirty or forty feet of water. Holy God! Wow. That's well, deep. maybe not. Maybe ten. Maybe maybe twenty feet off the shore, you're probably sitting in thirty feet of water. Yeah. I can't, that is insane. Like you've never thrown a, or not never thrown a crankbait, but like that would be okay. Yeah. I mean, I get to throw them at stairs, uh, but you know, like if I'm trying to improve something, like I don't really get a chance to do that often. Um, I don't get a chance to really flip mats much like Potomac in the summer, but we don't go there often. Like in the summertime, we usually hit the Potomac in the spring. So there's not a whole, like a ton of grass up yet. Yeah. And, and that kind of situation, man, it's just finding some of those, gra the submerging grass beds. I mean, you can fish hardcover if you want to, but the juice is to get onto some of those like emerging grass beds and just yeah. butcher them with, with your stereotypical jackhammer, lipless bait, things like that. And just deal with the crowds the best you can. And that's, what's so frustrating. I think about the Potomac and I get bored with is like, you just, you know where to go generic, generally speaking, and you just got to deal with the boat traffic. You got to just deal with the people, which is, it is kind of frustrating. So you live Honestly. down close to the Potomac. Is that where you fish most of the time? Yeah. So I, I basically, I, I basically grew up there and I, and I basically cut my teeth there from, oh, I don't know, age 10 till I went to college. And then, cause I fished, um, high school tournaments on there too. So I, I did that. And now I live up near, um, Williamsport, Maryland, Winchester, Virginia area up there. So I didn't move too far away from the Potomac, but I guess I would consider the title my home water. And I got to fish all over the country with college, which was a lot of fun. But, you know, you can't get away from your roots of, of the title stuff. Like, you just know it. I mean, because I think if you grow up there, you kind of understand there's certain things. Like, probably you do with smallmouth. 
but I don't like it. <laughs> it's just, it's boring to me because like of how the tides work and how much the tide condenses people. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like mad a woman. Okay. Well, <laughs> if you had a gun to my head and yeah. I, I had to cash a check, I would probably <laughs> sit in mad woman, Belmont or Aquia. Yeah. Kai is always, and, always, always, always back. You basically walk across everybody's boat every time I'm at the Potomac. Like, it, Kai is always backed. It sucks, and I think it also hurts you with boat etiquette because there's a different type of boat boating etiquette on the tidal Potomac than anywhere else. It's because you're just used to being bumper to bumper in the spring there, and that's just what you did. But then you go anywhere else, people are like, "Well, what are you doing?" It's like, "Well, you know, I grew up here." And they're like, "Oh, that makes sense." And I don't know. It's just it's just weird little things like that. <laughs> so, like, you grew up fishing that the Potomac River. You don't have like there's no like little secret spots. You just you just fish the grass. Everybody else fishes. You can have secret spots, but it depends if it's a multi-day event or a single day event. Yeah. Like a, a secret spot on a multi-day event will not last because people will see you at it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And so a one day event, yeah, you could probably get away with it, but it, it depends on how much you fish tournaments there. Cause there are so many local club tournaments that go out of there to where if I was fishing like the Potomac teams every single week, I wouldn't have a secret spot anymore because somebody would eventually see me there and the jig is up. So if I technically only fished two BFLs a year there, someone might not see me and I'll be able to like maybe cash a check there. It's just, it's just, it's so hard in that type of place. I think to keep a secret because it, it's so small. And like I guess Potom- it sounds kind of nice for that because like, I mean, I have stretches that I fish a lot, but that's they aren't always guaranteed to be there because they move around so much. So it's a lot of times. I think it's a timing thing. A lot of times you got to pull up on the right stretch at the right time, and it's yeah. uh, it's not like if somebody sees me on a spot that you know they can go fish that spot the next day and not catch fish. And I think that's what the Potomac would help you with. Is it's almost the reverse. It's the patience. Like if I sat in Belmont Bay and didn't move the boat for eight hours, I'd catch a limit. Yeah, because everyone else would get frustrated and leave and you you almost need to let that place settle down because they're all in they're all grouped up. You can run wood, but the majority of the population will be in grass beds when you can find good ones. And so if you just sit and camp like I could how many professionals have won in the back of Matter Woman is insane when that the traffic is but they're there. You you mentally just have to deal with it. There's going to be 800 boats coming in and out of here, Mm -hmm. but. Once they settle, once that water settles, you'll have your flurry. Because I think I think the reason is, and this is uh, it's great. I'll just blow this up for everybody else. I think it's not just the tide. I think it's boat traffic. And what yeah. I've noticed when I have won or have done well in tournaments, you have like fleets of boats that will come into a grass bed, fish it, and leave. And then mm-hmm. fleets will come in and fish it and leave. And once everyone like leaves, you have this little 20-minute gap where it's just calm. And then you'll start smoking them. Then everyone comes in and they stir things up and you just wait till everyone fishes it and say like, this place sucks and yes. you leave and it, and it calms down again and you, and you catch a few more. Noted and for myself in the next couple of months. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. But, but yeah, but that's like, but then if you go to a running gun place, I don't think I could do that because I'm so used to like, this is the area and you just sit here. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's just an interesting mindset and culture difference. Um, on race time, I feel like they pull up and pull back. Like, I do think you need to be at the right place at the right time. And then, um, like I, I don't spend a lot of time on one spot. If they're not there, like I'll, I'll pick up and go somewhere else because if they're there you, you probably get bit. Is that the same thing with like the Pittsburgh tournament or these grinder tournaments? Are you more of a running gun? Is that more of your vibe? Than I'm like not, just I don't have a ton of experience on Pittsburgh, but I'm, I'm I think I've been there twice. Um, uh, the well, one time, well. <laughs> the time I finished second there, I stayed in one spot, and I really, yeah, I yes, yeah, I, one. It was like a, uh, it was like a uh, what do they call those? Um, shoot, those those uh, big giant boats that go up and down the river. I'm trying to think what it's called. Shock uh, boats, barges, it barge. It was a barge. It was like a, it was a barge that was like like had wrecked. And I would, it, it was like nice current running into it. it. Had like a big current break, and I was just throwing a spinner bait in there. And they would, I actually caught spots. I was catching spotted bass. Really? Yeah, yeah they were, but they're not like the spotted bass you would catch on Hartwell. Like these are different, like a different, um, what's the word? Um, Dinky, small. Well, they were little. Yeah, they were only 12 and a half, 13 inches long. But they, people, like, because I, when I brought them in, I was like, these are spots. They're like, yeah, they're spots, but they come from 
like the the Tennessee River chain, I guess. Like, mm. they, so they're not big. Like they're pretty small. Like they don't get as big as like the Hartwell spots. Alabama bass. I bet that's what they are. Is those Alabamas? Yeah. Even issue down here with those things because they they, they kind of like they'll kill your smallmouth population. They'll just interbreed and like turn them into mutts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there were a lot mm-hmm. of them in there. Yeah. Like the, uh, the spots, I was catching a bunch of them and a lot of them didn't even measure. Like a lot were 10 inches long and then every now and I get a 13 incher. That's so frustrating. Oh. <laughs> just the idea of just to dink your way to like oh, success. What, what was your kicker in that tournament? <laughs> uh, you know, what's crazy is the week before when I went to practice in that spot, I caught a three and a half pound large mouth and that, oh yep. And, and I posted it on Facebook and people were like, that's a giant for there. Like that's huge. And then, um. And then I didn't catch it in the tournament. I was trying to, but I, I obviously didn't bite. Uh, but the week before, I caught a good one. But my my kicker in that tournament was probably 1.05 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, why would they send you there? <laughs> uh, so because miserable. a lot of a lot of people live near there. I think a lot of people like you know Pittsburgh. Like we probably have a lot of members from that area, so they that's their home water. And like I said, I think the Mon River is better. Like, but it was so it was so muddy that year that they like, just didn't really work out for people that went and fished around the Mon. Yeah, I, I guess it's so weird that I keep forgetting that Pittsburgh. I mean, like Pittsburgh is in PA, but like that, that feels like it's such a different world compared to where you live. Like, oh yeah, it was really weird. Like you were like I was traveling through this like three rivers, like uh, like the the stadiums right there. You're you know what I mean? Like it's really strange to. And the Potomac's like that too. Like you're, you're, you know, you're going right through DC sometimes. It's yeah. Like a dead body is shooting just to get to a place to actually like <laughs> go, f- <laughs> go yeah. fish. So race town, it's, it's very like, um, sec- like there's no, there's no shoreline, um, structures at all. Like it's, it's owned by the army Corps of engineers. So like there's no buildings or anything. It's all very, yeah, it's woods. Damn. Is it's, there like a pretty. hotel near there or is like, there's- like in the middle of nowhere? Is there what? Is it? Is there like any people around there? Is it just literally in the middle of nowhere? No, it, uh, the, the city of Huntington's there, um, and it has like a university, Juniata College is there. Uh, oh, wow. They have a prison there, hospital. Like it's not <laughs> like it's not like in the middle of, the, of nowhere, but the lake is is surrounded by woods because nobody can build on it, so it's kind of nice. Oh. Yeah, like there aren't any That's homes. The homes on Racetown are at the very top of the mountain. Like they can't build down near the lake. So then I get like, like you said that there's no docks then is there any like lay downs or like, what is the oh, cover? Yeah. yeah there's place? a ton of lay downs. There's a ton of trees and old okay. water. Um, and there's grass in some places before they kill it. If, if they don't kill it, it actually has some nice grass in it. If they don't kill off the grass, but they've been killing it off the last few years. So there is still grass, like don't give it away, but like it's still there. They just poisoned it out of existence. No, you can find it. It's, it's okay, still there yeah. in certain spots. Yeah. But not as much as it used to be. Like you could, there'd be a lot of places with grass, but you kind of, it's to find a grass patch is a pretty big deal now. I'll have to have the army Corps of engineers on and actually have them talk about that. Cause I'd like to know their reasoning for like just completely decimating all of it. That seems like a little bit overkill. Right. I think that. all the bass anglers would love, love to hear their response. <laughs> Yeah, because like, especially when there's no homeowners, like Deep Creek makes a little sense because everyone has a dock. But right. If there's nobody there. Right. Who, who are you doing it for? Exactly. No, you're right. That's a good point. Like, yeah, there's not anybody that lives on the lake. So, yeah. Yeah. Like, that makes no freaking sense to me. And now, like, I mean, looking at this on a map, like, yeah, you're right. There's like, there is nothing. Like, it's very rural. Mm-hmm. And it, that would just, it makes no ecological sense to do that to the lake at all. Wow, it's steep too. Okay. Yeah. Oh, God. It, yeah, it's very deep. Um, how safe is this to navigate for people that want to go there? Like, is it dangerous? Like, it looks like with a river system like this, like wind would be an issue. No, it actually isn't too windy because the, there's some big, big mountains on all on both sides of you. So, like, it doesn't really get. I mean, it it, it does. Like this weekend, supposed to be really windy. You know, spring and fall. But normally it's pretty calm. Um, the the dangerous part is the people. Like you get a lot of pleasure boaters there. Like I said, because there's not anywhere else for anybody to go, and uh, there's not a lot of space for the pleasure boaters to get you know by each other. So like you you're pretty close to each other when you're you know traveling up and down the lake. So there's always a couple mm. couple casualties and you know throughout the year either 
people, you know, trying to swim across it or have a boating accident. There's, yeah, it's a little dangerous. I guess not, it's not like you're going to run into like a shoal or anything like that, but it's mostly dangerous because of all the pleasure boaters. I had Matt sell on who's the DWR agent for the deep Creek Lake area. And he talks about like how that's a big issue now is wake boats. And like yeah. when you have all these houses and people, you're begging for bad things to happen. And it, 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 something has to be done about this. Even Lake Anna, Lake Anna is, near, is, is a lake in, in Virginia that gets a lot of Northern Virginia, DC residents coming down. And you basically do not see day tournaments like from May until October because there's so many jet jet skis and wake boats. It's insane. And come on, like something has to be done about that too, guys. Like for the people that are listening, like we got to find some way to bring that down a little bit just for safety. Yeah. Yeah. I've been on deep Creek a few times. I actually really like that lake. And, um, that's a lake I've actually, so actually had a great tournament on that lake with a crankbait one year. I had got 20 pounds of large mouth in a spring tournament there with a crankbait. So you were asking about crankbaits. That, that's one lake I can go and fish, but it's a good ways off with a crankbait. Dude, I had a guy on that. He's caught over, I think he's a 2000 bass in in a year out of that place mm-hmm. like he like an insane number that he's caught out of that place in one year and it is loaded i went up there this past fall and i actually caught a um almost a what was it almost a 40 inch pike out of that thing. oh really like, it's a it's a really cool place yeah the, the uh, dwr has been stocking it because they're trying to make it a, a world-class pike fishery now oh, okay yeah there's a lot of grass in it i know that it, yeah it's it's really nice and it, it will help you become a better grass fisherman too uh, definitely. It reminds me a lot of like Lake Chica- Chautauqua, like a lot of those Northern Finger Lakes, which is with how the grass sets up there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> oh. Well, and, no, I mean, dude, I, I really thank you, um, you know, for coming on. I know you're a super busy man, but yeah, just like what other things about like PA would people, do you think would be cool for people to know about or anything else like that? Um, Obviously, Lake Erie is a great lake. If you're, you know, you're fishing Pennsylvania, that's that's probably our top lake, um, Presque Isle Bay. You can go up there and catch largies in the bay. Or you can go out on the lake and get some giant smallies. Uh, There's largemouth in Lake Erie. Yeah, in the bay, in Presque Isle Bay. Really? Oh yeah, lots of them. Presque Isle Bay in the press in Presque Isle Bay. There, you could catch twelve pounds of largemouth. A well, five fish, you know, but you're not going to be able to compete with the guys going out and catching smallmouth. They're going to come back with. Yeah, you know, sixteen to twenty pounds. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of largies in there. Um, I don't know. I we have a lot of smaller lakes in PA, but the the problem is, is there's not like a lot of them are restricted horsepowers. So like I, I have a 250 on the back of my boat. I'd have to just use my trolling motor. You know, it's just kind of a pain in the butt. So there's not a ton of lakes that offer uh, unrestricted horsepower. Lake Wall and Pawpack up in north northeast PA is a pretty decent lake. I've caught some pretty big largies in there. That gets hammered too, though. It's near Wilkes Barre. A lot of people from the city come fish that. So, I think the lakes just get a lot of pressure. Now, like, I mean, we, we kind of briefly talked about it, but like, is there a lot of electric motor only trolling like trolling motor lakes in PA? I think there are. Yeah, like I don't know them all because I don't fish a ton of them. But yeah, just yeah. in my general area, I can think of probably like six of them. They, they're all smaller, you know. We're Oh wow! Yeah, but they're we're talking like the size of probably smaller than Mattawama Creek, you know, like mm. not very big at all. Okay, yeah, because I I know like um in Virginia, for example, it's got like a ton of electric motor only lakes, and I think it's like only second to Georgia mm-hmm. for the most. And I just know that because like torpedo sales and like what states sell the most like electric motors, um, and that's interesting because like you can still catch a lot of big fish in some of those small. Oh lakes. yeah, and, and that's. And that's something that's good for like anglers to know. Like it doesn't have to be like a race or something else like that. There are other opportunities for you to get hooked on bass fishing. Yeah. It just might not, you might not be able to have a gas. Motor. If you have a kayak, I'm sure this is heaven for you because like, you know, you don't have to deal with boats. So they got the it's electric, only, too, electric yeah. motor or uh, electric only motors would probably be a great place to take a kayak. What kind of boat are you running? Uh, I have a nitro Z8 right now. Oh, nice. Mm-hmm. Not nice. I'm getting I'm getting a new one next year. But <laughs> it's not. You, you stick it, with nitro? Honestly, like, I love, like, my boat, like, it, it's not gonna, it's not fancy. It's not flashy. But, like, it has been very solid. Like, I, the live wells are amazing. I've never had a fish die in them. They're huge. They get, you know, they have oxygenators. It's, 
I, everything my boat needs to do for me, it does. It's just not flashy or fancy, you know, like, and I, uh, and I'm at the point in my life where I'm ready to go get a flashy, fancy boat now, though. So next next year. But do you really, well, really want to spend that. 150 thousand? No, like, I'm you know not what spending I mean? that. I'll, I'll probably buy one. It's a year or two <laughs> used, but I want a warranty on my motor. Like I have a two. It's a 2011, mm. and it runs great. But in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking like, if I'm in a big tournament and this thing breaks down or something, I'm going to be pissed. Um, yeah. Uh, but it's. It's been a great boat, you know, uh, and, and the other part of that is, as I was thinking about it, it's like I kind of beat it up a little bit sometimes. So like, <laughs> like I, I pull it up onto the shore and I don't worry about a scratch. You know what I mean? Whereas if I go get myself, you there, yeah, I'm here. Uh, no, I was like, I understand. Like, you know, that's the issue I have when I talk to my wife is like, you know, my boat is a, I have a uh, 2002 uh, 21 foot Ranger. And it's mm-hmm. like, I love the thing to death. I replaced the motor like six, seven years ago. And it's like it's paid for. I keep telling myself that yeah, you know, I look at these new boats and I want something it. new. Yeah. Yep. And it's like that, that's so nice because it's, it it's nice. just, I mean, and I don't worry about beating it up, you know, Same. like I don't worry yeah. about beating it up a little bit. Oh, if it gets, but it gets, I'll be honest. Like I had it down at the Potomac. They had that, what was it? The BASS uh, us open down there at the Potomac last year. I took it down there and uh, going back from DC to Matawan, it, it got the rub rails were all falling off. Like, it got beat up pretty bad. Yeah. And and that's the, I was like, man, I think I'm ready for another one. Like I'm ready for something a little newer, a little more put okay, together. I want, I want, I want the warranty. Um, probably get, what'd you ask? What was I going to get? What's your dream boat? Oh, I'll, it's not necessarily my dream boat, but I'll probably get a Skeeter because they offer incentives with that through Bass Nation. Like if you finish, Ooh. if you're the first place Skeeter boat, you get like an extra like couple grand. So like, that's probably what I'll get. And I like them. They're nice looking, but Bass Cat would probably be my favorite. It's just, they're crazy expensive. Dude, those things go like 200 miles an hour too. Like they're yeah, they're fast. they're nice boats. I, I just I can't ever find one in my price range. I'm not looking to spend eighty thousand uh, dollars. I'll probably I'll yeah. probably be looking I'll probably be looking in the forty to fifty thousand dollar range. A boat should not be a hundred thousand dollars. It should <laughs> not be a mortgage payment. It makes yeah. no sense to me how they keep yeah. going up in price. And here and, and honestly, like that that's not gonna. I mean, it sure looks nice, but I don't think it's gonna help me finish any higher in tournaments. It's not like I've yeah. done, like I've, I know if people have kicked my butt, tons of people have taken my money with something that looks like it should have been in the Jaws movie. Like yeah. it does not, right. it doesn't help you to have like that brand new, brand new thing. I mean, I think some boats probably do ride better. Like I, I right. hear the Phoenix is supposed to ride well, but still right. it's like, but does it ride for $180,000 worth of yeah. ride? Well? Right. I, and I don't, I don't know about that. I think I'm more looking at it. Like I want that warranty peace of mind. Like I, like the other day in that tournament, you know, on Sunday, I, I hit a log, you know what I mean? I'm like, Oh God. Like if I, if I, my lower unit goes out, there's two, th- there goes my winnings, you know? Oh my God. <laughs> so, Jesus, good but Lord. It, Did it, you- that's the kind of thing I don't want to worry about anymore. Like I, like I want a warranty on my motor. Did you know you had it one going back um, to weigh in? No, like that's how good that lake can be like I, I there are some really i'm telling you there's some really good sticks that fish that lake and and no i didn't feel confident like i felt like i had a good day and i thought i'd get a check for sure i thought i probably could want it with what i had but like i wouldn't have been surprised for somebody to come in and beat me or at least been real close you know what i mean like i think second place was 15 something so like i had 16. for three correct yep yep, yep. Good god man right that's insane yeah, yeah so like i yeah i mean it's there's some really good really good sticks on the lake and there's some really big fish in the lake but it's also really hard to fish too like like it's not an easy lake to fish it's definitely you have to learn it and a lot of people would probably if you went there for the first time you probably struggle like it it's it's taken a long time for me to to do well there and i still suck there like i you know, summertime, <laughs> listen, summertime, and it could be, I could go this weekend and do terrible. It very easily could happen. Like, like they're nomadic. Like you said, they could be there one week and go on the next. Um, but mm. yeah. Will the state record smallmouth come out of there? No, I don't think I, I mean, what's that? Eight, eight, four, maybe something like that. I don't, I eight think, and you caught three for 16 or something like that's, I'm not pretty strong. There, there might be one in there. I'm not saying there isn't, um, Cause there are, there's a lot of bait, but I think, I think more likely to come out of Erie. Yeah. yeah like, yeah, Erie's, Erie's, Erie's strong, but there's a lot of places. <clears throat> I mean, I, I know just from the DWR doing their shockings and really learning from that side of things, like 
some of the big ones they pull out and they're like, yeah, it's like you wouldn't believe some of the state records we do when we do electric surveys and like we just put them back and we yeah. be like, yep, there's a state record in this, like this, like this, like I'm like, crazy. holy crap. What, what, what is in this place? What's in this place? And, and so I don't know. That's just always fascinating to me. Like there's probably more state records swimming around than we give. They'll never be caught, but they're be, actually there. What a great job that would be. I would love to have that job. <laughs> See all Oh my those. God. Yeah. <laughs> get paid to go. I mean, that's like, I mean, that's what I, t I told them. It's like, I would rather catch a state record than win a, a bass tournament, a big tournament. Like there's something more about that. That would be cool. Yeah. I that would be really me. cool. Yeah. And I'll be honest with you. You talk about state records. I believe the next large mouth state record will come out of Sayers. I really do. I've seen so many giants. Right. Come, oh yes. Every spring. Like I see them on Facebook, people posting seven, eight. Like I said, I caught one. It was almost eight out of there. And I've seen, I saw one that was almost 10 on Facebook. It was like nine and a half pounds. And, it, and I'm, I, I seriously believe there's ones in there over 10. Now the state record's 11, 11, three. I think that's gonna be tough to beat, but I mean, I don't know. Sarah's has got some giants in it. I don't, I don't know what they're eating. Yeah. 11, three. Yeah. I think yeah, Birch Run reservoir. Yeah. It doesn't exist anymore either. It does, it's not even around anymore. It's, it's like, it's a uh, dry land now, I believe. Uh, but Sayers has got a lot of, uh, I think they, eat, I think they eat like uh, crappy. There's a ton of crappy in there. They must feed up on those. They get huge. Dude, that actually, that makes a lot of sense. Cause like 11, 11 is a strong number. Oh, it's like, huge. But yeah, that's that, that could be, oof, I don't know. That, that could be beaten. Virginia's is crazy. Virginia's is almost 17 pounds. Which makes oh, wow, I still crazy. to this day think was that a it is. Train? And I think, I think it was a private pond and they fed it. Okay, because that, that's my seen, thinking. Like, that's not is a northern strain get that big? It seems like a Florida strain bass. It's a Florida strain, and based on what they say, like sixty percent of the genes in in Virginia are Florida strain. It's yeah. been so mixed lately that's since of all the stocking. Hmm. So, and, and it, which is crazy. But then again, Virginia is like a big ass state, and so down south is where it came from. I think it came below richmond the exact pond and i know i know maryland state record is is the title of potomac i think it was called on a silver buddy how, how big is that um, i think it was 11 pounds that makes sense yeah that makes sense i've never caught i think five is the biggest i ever caught at potomac but what's I mean, your biggest smallmouth uh six pounds at a, at a race town i think it was like six, six pounds, pounds one ounce yeah you know, and here's the thing that's great like i have caught a million you there there i got you back i keep losing you um, you have caught a million what oh uh, i've caught a lot a lot of smallmouth over five pounds a lot but not many over six it seems like that's a really tough barrier to break here in pa a lot over five a lot in that's a different over. animal that's a but different six? animal. it's so it, it, but it is strange to me because it, it frustrates me a little bit like like I catch a lot of fours, a lot of, and I do catch a lot of five. Oh no. Did I finally, I lost you again. <laughs> I keep losing you. Yeah. It's all good, dude. Um, that's why we do pre edits. Um, yeah, it, it's what did that six pounder pull? Like, like, is that pull differently? Does it feel differently on the end of your line when it gets that big? Well, the one I caught in the tournament Sunday was five, nine, five. So it was real close to being six. Uh, no, not at the, and I caught the six earlier actually this year at race town. It, it, uh, this time of year, they kind of come in like a wet sock anyway. Like they're not gonna, they're not gonna like battle super hard. You know, they're cold. The water's 42 degrees. Um, Oh my God. That's actually decent. Like 42 is pretty good. Like we were catching in January, the water was 38. You can still, I mean, you, like I said, you can catch them down at race town all, all year and, uh, that's probably my favorite time to go is actually in the, in the winter. Why? No, no pressure. You're the only one out there. And the uh, ones you catch, the ones you catch are always giant. Like you don't get a whole lot of small ones. If you get one in a, in the winter, it's usually a big one. But 40 degrees. Good Lord. I think the Potomac, the Potomac team series, it took 24 pounds to win and the water temperature is like 55. Like that's insane. Cause I don't feel like the Potomac and race are that far apart. Yeah, no, it's 42 right now. And that, and that's warmed up. It was, it's just now getting to 42. It's been mostly 38 all, all January, February, March here. 
how do smallmouth spawn on a lake? Or is it different than like a river? Like, do they spawn in the shallows like largemouth? Or are they like off in the middle of nowhere? No, they go back in a, you know, like a cove protected area, like away from the wind a little bit. They get, they spawn deeper, like largemouth will get, you know, maybe like two, three feet deep. The smallies are probably more like eight. Cause I, I've seen the, like, I've seen the, um, like when they're on the St. Lawrence and they're using these floggers, I guess, and they're sticking their head in the water. Is yeah. that stuff that you can do on Racetown or is that just like just a, a Northern thing? No, you could, you no, I've never seen anybody use a flogger on Racetown. I've seen them use it at Erie. Like Erie last year, um, in our regional last year, there were people using floggers on Erie. Really? Mm-hmm. Yep. Have you have you used one? Like, does it? How, no. Is that I hard? Really, like, I really. I, after that tournament, I thought I really should have used one. Yes. I mean, um, no, I haven't used one before. I'd like to. I'd like to. I should go make one, but. <laughs> I, yeah, you wouldn't be able to is. use it honestly you wouldn't be able to use it at race town anyway because it drops so fast like it's and i guess you could you would probably scare them off though at race town if you got that close to them you know what i mean like to look at them with the flow so they're they're more finicky at race town than like lake erie mm, i would think so yeah unless you're talking now i will say the ones in the bay at erie like the ones that are spawning and they'll come into prescott there to spawn they get they get absolutely smashed, and I'm sure they're really fin- they're probably more finicky than anything at Race Town. But on average, like throughout the year, I would say Race Town's more of a more pressured than Erie, yeah, because Re- Erie's huge. Hmm. Like there's a lot of place, there's a lot more space for those fish to go like, at Erie. Mm, that makes sense. That makes sense. Well, I mean, Doug, you know, thank you so much for coming on so late. I, I really appreciate it. Um, I try to ask a lot of my guests this question, like what are some goals you have for this year or some fishing wish, wish list things that you hope come true this year? Uh, well, my number one wish would be to, to go to the, uh, regional and finish first in the state and make it back to the national championship. That would be number one. Um, really tough task though. Like I said, there's a lot of good fishermen in PA and, and, and Potomac won't be one of my strengths. But um, that would probably be it. And then as far as like just outside of fishing, like just hoping for, you know, health for my family and, and um, my kids to have a, a good year in sports and at school. Awesome stuff. Well, then I think you're going to do great this year. And who knows, this might be actually your year. If you're able to catch them on the three rivers, I mean, there's nowhere, even Mars, that you can't catch them. Yeah, <laughs> but tough uh, again, guys, link in the episode description, everything we talked about. Um Doug, thank you again so much. I really appreciate you coming on. Guys, please like and subscribe to the channel. We are the number one fishing show in the greater DMV metropolitan area. We might be talking, but we're done. We'll see you next time. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.